Aloha and welcome to our presentation today. We are going to be learning about the basics of wound care assessment. Um, so nurses, uh, we are always uh, doing many, many different things in the clinical setting. We are assessing patients for um, their physical wellness. Uh, we assess their, their lungs, their heart, their abdomen. Uh, we make assessments of their vital signs. Um, and also, uh, there's another component to our assessment skills uh, that is extremely important, and that's the assessment of a wound. And so we're going to learn today about a lot of the nomenclature, meaning what um, are some of the words that we use to describe wounds and the characteristics of wounds. And so that is going to be uh, an important uh, idea for you to think about as I'm moving through this content. So you're going to want to make sure that uh, you know that there's some graphic visuals coming up uh, and so it may not be for everyone's eyes. However, as nurses, it's very important that we uh, make these observations and know uh, what it is that we are looking at. Um, this comes uh, to us from Nancy Morgan. Uh, she is a wound care education expert, and I think her presentation is one of the best I have ever seen. So with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and jump in. Um, I mentioned before that there are some uh, graphic images here, um, and this is all uh, for the purposes of learning, okay? And so I want you to keep that in mind. So we're, we're going to work on some terminology. We're going to learn about uh, acute versus chronic wounds. We're going to be able to describe uh, different aspects of the wound. And we're going to start uh, by classification. So wounds are classified uh, based upon the depth of tissue that, that is disturbed or tissue destruction. So here uh, you can see in these images, we've got um, the, outer, the outer layer uh, of skin, okay? Um, we've got the, the um, epidermis, uh, and we've got the dermis, and then we've got, you know, um, fat tissue, we've got muscles and tendons, if we go a little deeper, um, down to the bone. And so we're going to be classifying these wounds based on how deep into the tissue, um, the, the destruction of the tissue um, goes. And so <clears throat> wounds are either partial thickness or full thickness. And so here we can see in a partial thickness wound, we're talking about destruction of the epidermis and the dermis, all right? So we have, you know, a break in the very top layer of the skin, okay? I'm going to give you a second here just to look at this slide. Destruction of the epidermis and the dermis. And here we can see uh, some images of what a partial thickness wound would look like. Uh, we can see that it's kind of pink, usually um, very tender, very painful. Um, but notice that we don't see any yellowish tissue here. We're just looking at dis disruption of the um, uh, epidermis and dermis. In a full thickness uh, wound, we've got destruction of the epidermis and the dermis. However, we've also gone deeper into the subcutaneous or fat tissue and maybe even deeper. And so here we can see in this image, the epidermis has been disturbed, the dermis. Uh, we can see that this uh, wound goes deep enough into the subcutaneous tissue and maybe we can even visualize um, some, some deeper layers of bone and muscle. So these are some, uh, some examples of what a full thickness um, wound will look like. And notice that you can see some of that yellowing tissue. Um, oftentimes uh, that, that is subcutaneous tissue. Um, and that is an indication that it has gone deeper than the epidermis and the dermis. 
And so um, we also classify wounds based upon their healing times. And so uh, acute wounds, and this could be um, something that's uncomplicated, should heal really w within less than 12 weeks, okay? So this is a wound that um, does not get infected. This could be a surgical incision. This could be um, a wound from a trauma. Um, but the way that we define it as being acute is that it's not complicated. There's no issues that come about with healing. We've got good blood supply. We've got um, absence of any um, microbes invading the wound. And so within about 12 weeks, uh, this wound or this incision should heal. In a chronic wound, um, we do not have um, all the pieces together, right, for this patient for the wound to heal in a timely manner. So this is a wound that takes greater than 12 weeks to heal. Um, this could be due to the fact that there has been an infection. Um, for whatever reason, there is very poor blood supply to the wound. This can happen uh, in wounds um, on patients who are obese. Um, this can also happen uh, for patients who are diabetic. They have uh, poor wound healing. Um, there are lots of other reasons that wounds may not heal, um, but those are just some examples. Uh, we're going to talk about parts of a wound uh, in some terminology here. So uh, when we measure a wound, we're really only measuring the open area. And we measure the diameter from edge to edge. And then we document the size in centimeters. So what we're going to be documenting is the length of the wound, the width, and the depth. And I'm going to show you some examples of um, what, what this looks like. So here you can see um, the measuring uh, tape, and it's being measured in centimeters. We can see here that it's uh, being measured by its length and by its width. And then a little later, I'm going to show you how depth is measured. Um, depth is measured uh, by the, the bottom of the wound. Uh, and so here we can see the wound base, um, which is also referred to as the uh, bottom of the wound. Here we can see how depth is measured. Um, it's the vertical distance from the visible surface to the deepest area of the wound bed. And you can see here that a sterile Q-tip is being used. And what we often do is we'll take the Q-tip uh, with a gloved hand and we will go ahead and put it um, into the wound, into the deepest area. And then when we pull that out, what we do is we measure actually the Q-tip itself, how much of the Q-tip went in, into the deepest part of the wound. And in centimeters, we will measure that amount of the Q-tip to tell us how deep the wound is. There are also wound edges or margins. And this is the rim around the, the uh, wound, the inside uh, perimeter um, of the wound. And we can see the arrow here kind of pointing to the, the rim uh, or the edges of the wound. Uh, this is an example of um, a maceration where we're looking at the edges of the wound and we see that the coloring of the edges is a little different than the rest of the wound. And this can be an indication uh, that we have um, some poor uh, wound healing because you can see this, this rolled edge here, the way that it's curled under. Uh, what happens is that epithelial cells cannot migrate to close this wound. Okay, so if you see this uh, type of um, curled under uh, edge of a wound, uh, know that uh, there's going to be some complication here in uh, epithelial cells getting where they need to get in order for this uh, wound to close. And um, this word uh, that they use to describe this is epiboli. And um, I, had to, I had to look that up. Uh, that's not a word that you hear every day, um, but that is how it's pronounced, epiboli. Uh, here we can see that the wound edges um, are fibrotic. 
um, or hyperkeratotic, meaning that uh, there's an overgrowth of skin um, and also that it looks thickened um, and almost like a scar, a scar tissue. Uh, and again, uh, the same issue going on here where in this situation we cannot get the important new fresh cells to come in so that healing uh, can take place. What we're, what we're trying to accomplish here is for the wound to be able to close and this is not possible if a wound looks like this. Um, we also refer to the peri wound, and this is the surrounding tissue. So this is the outside perimeter of the wound, um, and here it's defining it as a, a minimum of, of four centimeters um, outside of the wound. Uh, so we can see here that in the center, we see <coughs> that there is a, a wound, and then we've got this tracing uh, that kind of defines this outer peri wound um, area where we can um, take a look at the skin because it's important to note what the skin looks like, not only in um, the tissue in the wound bed, um, but what the skin looks like on the outside of the wound bed because that can also give us an indication of how well the uh, wound is healing. Uh, here we see an example of erythema. Uh, another word for erythema is redness. And uh, we can see that this peri wound color would be defined as um, erythema. And we can see here that there is um, some infection in this wound. We see open skin, we see trauma. Uh, this is, um, um, there's inflammation here, right? So there's redness and infection. Uh, um, and the peri wound in this case uh, is giving us an indication that this may be even hot to the touch um, and that this is not a wound that is healing very well. Uh, the other thing we look for uh, on the uh, area around the wound is the uh, uh, color, um, a white color uh, that looks like it's very moist uh, on the outer part of the wound is something that we keep an eye out for. Um, this is referred to, um, uh, again, as like a maceration. Uh, this can be kind of wet. This can be from drainage that's coming from the wound. Uh, this can also be because of uh, the, the patient may be incontinent uh, of their urine and the wound may be wet for that reason. They also may be diaphoretic, meaning that they're sweating uh, a lot. And that could be another reason that there's moisture around the wound. Um, another uh, color that we might see is uh, blue or a purple. Uh, and in both cases, uh, what, what we would note would, would be that blue would tell us that there was poor blood flow, uh, which could be uh, resulting from a trauma. Purple could be um, from ecchymosis, from bruising, um, from a trauma uh, as well. Uh, I mentioned before the temperature of the peri wound can give us an indication of infection if, the, if it's literally hot and sometimes you look at it and it is so bright red um, that it, it almost looks, looks like it's hot and it's, it's hot to the touch. And also um, on the other uh, opposite side of that, it may be very cool to the touch um, or, or cyanotic. It may look bluish and cool. And this uh, would be an indication of poor blood flow uh, to the area. If we don't have good blood flow, certainly we are not going to have good wound healing. Um, again, uh, we mentioned this teri, uh, peri wound texture. Uh, we talked about this moist, uh, macerated, boggy, soft, mushy looking skin. And we, we did define uh, how those things could be. This could be from excessive drainage from the wound. It could be from incontinence, uh, urine, uh, wet bed sheets. It could be from sweating um, or diaphoresis. So there are multiple reasons why you might see this peri wound texture. Um, uh, um, in a patient. And certainly, uh, this is not what we want. Uh, we want to make sure that the skin around the wound is clean and dry. Uh, here we see induration. 
Uh, and in this case, um, this is kind of firm or hard uh, when, you, when you would palpate this area. And um, these are all signs that our wound is, is not healing properly. Uh, edema or swelling is another thing that we might see. Uh, this is due to accumulation of fluid in the tissues. Um, surrounding the wound and so I like to now we've covered two of my uh, my, my, my E's uh, in terms of uh, assessing a wound uh, the two to two E's that we've we've come across so far are erythema or redness and now we're looking at edema or swelling okay and so these are just some um, other words that we use to um, assess and define the wound here we can see that there's loss of the epidermis um, caused by exposure to urine, feces, body fluids, wound exudate, um, and a combination of that with some friction um, will leave you with a, a denuded uh, wound here. And uh, again, uh, properly turning our patients, properly caring uh, for our patients in terms of keeping the bedding clean and dry, keeping the skin clean and dry will prevent this type of um, problem from happening. Here we see an excoriation uh, where we've got uh, loss of epidermis, uh, destruction of the skin uh, usually by um, mechanical means. Let's see here. All right. Um, here uh, we see an example of erosion. Uh, there's loss of the epidermis, part or all of it, uh, where, you know, once that, that covering, right, that outer layer of skin, remember the skin is the largest organ in our body. Uh, once that has been compromised, then there's always that opportunity for microbes to migrate in uh, to the body from that, from that opening, okay? Uh, here we see some lesions, uh, also example of rash. Uh, these can occur from different types of allergic reactions, uh, different types of um, problems uh, with the skin. Um, skin cancer can cause uh, lesions. Um, people can be allergic to certain things in the environment uh, that can cause rashes. And uh, we refer to these as lesions. Uh, tunneling is another important uh, assessment observation that a nurse needs to make uh, if this is present in the wound. Uh, and what this means is this, that there is a channel or pathway that extends in any direction from the wound through the sub subcutaneous tissue. And so in this image, you can see that a Q-tip has been uh, pushed from uh, one part of the wound all the way through to another place where the um, skin has been broken. And you can see that there is some tunneling. And it's, it's, it's uh, uh, moving from the wound deeper into the tissues. Um, here's another um, example of tunneling. You can see where this arrow is pointing to. And uh, the best way to find out how deep this goes again is to take a sterile q-tip and go ahead and put it um, into that tunnel and see how far it goes until that q-tip uh, stops until it meets something uh, on the other end some tissue and then you pull that q-tip out and then you can measure how much of that q-tip went into that tunneling to see how deep that tunneling is and we can measure that in centimeters um, so tunneling uh, is an important thing to note. Uh, oftentimes we'll have orders to pack wounds that have tunneling. We will pack these with um, Dakin's uh, soaked uh, gauze, new gauze, um, or um, any other type of uh, packing that the physician orders for our, our dressing changes. Um, so understanding how to care for these wounds is an entirely different lecture, but just learning about how we observe the wounds is really what we're focused on today. Um, there's also something that's called undermining, and this is when tissue destruction um, is underlying the intact skin along the wound margin. Uh, and so what we see here is we can see this 
Q-tip has been inserted into this tunneling and um, actually what we see on the outside is actually how deep that Q-tip is going in. So the Q-tip on the inside is put in until it, until it, um, is, it stops and then we pull that out and we measure it. And here we can see on the outside, that's actually how deep that tunneling, or I'm sorry, that undermining um, goes, okay? Uh, here's another example of undermining. Um, and so uh, some people get confused between undermining and tunneling. Tunneling actually goes deep within to the into the tissue, right? So tunneling goes deeper into the subcutaneous tissue um, and un undermining is different in that the tissue destruction that occurs here is just right underneath the intact skin that is on top, okay? And so undermining will run along the wound margin. Um, so now uh, we're going to take a look at some of the types of tissue that we can see. And um, non-viable tissue uh, is also considered dead tissue. So these words are all used together. Non-viable, dead, no blood uh, flow. This tissue is, is necrotic. Okay, necrotic uh, means dead. And so some of the words we use to describe uh, necrotic tissue um, can be slough. That is how this word is pronounced. S-L-O-U-G-H is pr pr uh, pronounced slough. And this is a yellow, green, gray, um, a lighter colored, thin, kind of a, a wet or even stringy um, type of tissue. And then eschar is the black, brown, gray. It's kind of a darker, thicker, and harder uh, type of tissue. Um, both of them are not uh, tissue that is going to be um, good for, for healing because we've got no blood flow here and we've got dead tissue. And so let's take a look at what some of these tissues look like. Here is an example of slough. Uh, you can see it here in this hand and in this other wound. Um, so what we need to recognize here is we're not seeing subcutaneous tissue, okay? Um, subcutaneous tissue is also yellowish in color, um, but slough is different in that you can see that these, these images here are showing a wound bed that isn't really deep, right? These aren't deep wound beds, but you still see this yellowish, um, color um, to indicate that, that there is actually, this tissue is dead, okay? And then uh, here we see some more examples of slough. Um, again, these do not look like healthy wound beds. They look like uh, wound beds that are, are, are not healing. And um, again, these don't go very deep, right? So we're not looking at um, subcutaneous tissue here. We're looking at slough, which is a type of tissue that is just not getting blood supply. Um, here are some examples of eschar. We can see that this is this hard, thickened, black, dark colored tissue um, that is absolutely dead and healing will not take place um, on, this, on this wound as long as these tissues are there. And a lot of times these types of tissues have to be mechanically or surgically um, debrided so that we have to get the dead tissue out so that we can get new tissue to grow in its place. Um, here's another example of eschar. Um, and then um, moving on, we can see uh, epithelialization, ep epithelial tissue, um, the outermost layer of skin. Uh, this is kind of a, a deep pink to a pearly pink um, close to the wound. And this is kind of what we're, we're looking for uh, when we're looking for, for uh, wound healing. We're looking for good, healthy epithelial tissue. Um, Again, we can see an example here of some epithelial tissue. Um, this is an indicator that you know we're starting to get some healing here. Some good cells have been able to migrate in um, for healing. Granulation tissue um, is really new tissue that replaces the dead tissue. A lot of times you'll hear nurses refer to this as beefy 
red. Um, this is actually good tissue. This is going to grow from the base of the wound outward. Okay, um, so heal, uh, healing wounds, uh, the tissue is going to grow um, from the bottom of the wound upward. And this is granulation tissue. And um, uh, beefy red granulation tissue is considered to be healthy. This is what we, what we want to see. Uh, here's another example of some granulation tissue in a wound that is healing. Um, here's some more granulation tissue. We see healing taking place here. Um, here we can see uh, a little bit of hypergranulation where uh, it's forming above the surface of the skin. Um, this delays epithelial, epithelialization and um, it's, it's almost kind of like this, this excess tissue um, that, that probably, again, interferes maybe with um, good blood flow. And it's, uh, it almost uh, seems kind of like scarring to me, like what I would think of as, as a scar tissue, this hypergranulation tissue. Uh, here we can see some muscle tissue, uh, pink to dark red, highly vascularized. That means it's richly supplied with blood. So again, it, it's easier to think about this in terms of nice beefy red pink um, is showing us that we are getting good uh, blood flow. Okay, And so this is a striated, um, striped, grooved, or ridge. This is healthy muscle tissue that is, is showing healing. Um, again, here we see some mus muscle tissue um, coming in uh, to a, a wound that has, has been healing for a very, very long time and um, probably has had to have a lot of, of debridement um, and treatment so that new um, granulation tissue and muscle tissue can start growing back. Um, here we can see a tendon. Tendons attach our muscles to our bones. Um, tendons are shiny when they're healthy. So if we're observing a wound and a tendon is visible, um, what we're looking for is to see if that uh, tendon looks kind of shiny. Here's another uh, really good example of a nice beefy uh, red wound bed. We can see a nice shiny tendon. Uh, and, and what we see here is, is good healing taking place. Um, here we see an example of fascia. This is the covering that's over uh, muscles. Uh, this is a shiny, um, kind of a white, um, almost like a, a covering that goes over top of muscles. So this is fascia that's growing uh, back. Here we can see bone. Uh, this is kind of shiny and smooth here. Uh, this is what bone would look like uh, in, the, in the deepest part of a wound bed. And so again, we want to uh, look for healthy tissue in that wound base. Um, that color should be nice and bright red. Here we see a wound base color that is more of a pale pink. Um, this is an indicator of um, poor blood flow uh, or, or blood supply to the wound. Um, this could be in the case of a, a, a patient um, that's uh, suffering from anemia. Okay. Uh, here we can see purple, um, engorged, swelling, um, high bacteria levels. This is a very unhealthy uh, looking wound base color here. Uh, again, we're, we're seeing necrotic tissue now in the wound base. This is not the kind of uh, wound base we want to see for good wound healing to be taking place. Um, and so this is non-viable necrotic tissue. Okay. Again, we see slough in this wound base. This is not viable tissue. Uh, we got to get rid of this tissue uh, in order for healthy tissue to come. Now, again, we have to deal with whatever the underlying problems are, right? If we have to get better control over the patient's blood sugars, we have to work on the patient's nutritional status for wound healing. We have to keep bacteria from migrating into that wound if the wound is near, um, you know, where, where their anus is, right? If they're having incontinence and bowel movements and urine, um, that is all going to complicate 
complicate the situation much more. So part of helping solve this is to uh, get the patient into a state um, of better nutrition, better uh, glucose control, if that's the case, um, deal with their anemia if they're anemic, and uh, that can be dealt with nutritionally or through the use of, of certain vitamins and medications. Um, and again, uh, this time what we're looking at is actual infection. We can see a greenish color. Um, this is not what we want to see. Uh, here's another example of, of a wound base that's macerated. Uh, again, this is poor blood flow. Uh, here is my third E. This is my third E um, when I teach about wound assessment. I always teach about the three E's. So we have seen erythema or redness, which we use to describe a lot of things related to wounds. We, we had the word edema, which refers to swelling. And now we have exudate, which is a fancy word for drainage, right? So it's very important to be able to document the type and the amount of drainage that's coming from the wound as well. Um, and so there's many different causes of drainage. Here we can see um, that bacteria, infection, necrosis, uh, swelling, trauma, uh, foreign objects can all um, kind of um, be culprits. Uh, types of exudate here we can see uh, serous. This is a thin, clear, watery plasma. This is what we would describe as a serous drainage. Here we can see a sanguinous drainage. So this is bloody. This is like a bright red bloody drainage referred to as sanguinous. And then we have serosanguinous. And this is a thin, watery, kind of a pale red to pink type, type of drainage where it's kind of red, but it's kind of serous. So I'm gonna go through those three again. They're very important for you to know. Serous, sanguinous, and serosanguinous. Uh, here's a purulent drainage. This is kind of a thick, opaque, tan, yellow, green, or brown color. Um, this, is, this is usually an indication of a not-so-good drainage. If it's green, if it's brown, if it's tan, if it has a foul odor, then we're looking at purulent drainage, and um, usually uh, it's infectious material that's being drained from the wound. Uh, in here, uh, we see a wound that's it's, it's almost kind of done healing. The wound tissues are dry and there's no exudate at all um, on this particular wound here. Here, um, we're describing the amount. So it's important, again, to perk up your ears. Uh, we're looking at scant drainage. Um, there's really no measurable drainage, but we can see that the wound bed is kind of, of moist. All right, and that there's, there's drainage coming from the wound, but we refer to this as scant. Uh, this drainage on this dressing, um, I think this is a dressing. I don't think this is an actual um, wound. This is a small or minimal amount of uh, dressing. So we have scant, which is very little, and then we have minimal, which we see here on this dressing. This is moderate where the gauze is nearly uh, 25 to 75% saturated with some type of drainage. We call this moderate drainage. And here we see large copious amounts of drainage. This is when the dressing is more than 75% saturated with some type of drainage. And so again, we would refer to this as a large amount, or you will also hear nurses refer to this as copious amounts of drainage. Uh, odors uh, do come from wounds as well. And so these are some of the words we use to describe uh, odors from a wound. Strong, foul, pungent, fecal, musty, uh, sweet. The cause of odors coming from a wound can be from dead tissues, can be from bacterias, and also from uh, a buildup of drainage. Okay. 
So that concludes our wound assessment lecture. Uh, these are the resources where all this information came from. I hope you learned something good today about how to describe a wound, how to measure a wound, how to identify whether a wound is healing well or not. And I thank you for your attention and I hope you have a great day. Aloha.